Hello and welcome to Catalyze Music Academy. My name is Zach Christeter and I'm Ableton Certified Trainer. And today I want to talk to you about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, which is live performance with Ableton Live, because there are a lot of different ways to approach this and a lot of them are great and really amazing. But I want to focus in on one specific method and set of problems you may deal with when building your own custom live performance setup, uh, which is basically how to have multiple backing track kind of setup where you can switch back and forth between different instruments or different sounds all on the fly. And this is the way I've been performing for a long time. I really enjoy it. I think it's a lot of fun. And I honestly stole most of these ideas from the Glitch Mob, who I think have a really cool, really interesting live performance setup. Just a little quick caveat, uh, if you did click on the link because you saw the name Glitch Mob, uh, I don't have any insider info about how their setup is built. I have you know watched videos and I'm talking about it, read interviews, and this is kind of what I've gathered and interpreted from how they perform. I do think that their setup has evolved a little bit from the way I'm doing it, which I will discuss towards the end of the video. But if you like their setup and you think it's really cool, and that's you know, you're thinking about that kind of way of performing and you want a good place to get started, this is essentially my interpretation and how I built my setup based off of their ideas. So before we dive too deep into it, just want to let you know, if you are enjoying the content on the channel, please feel free to subscribe. On top of that, if you are already subscribed, you know, like, comment, all that kind of stuff. Um, you guys are awesome. I love you guys. And um, yeah, let's dive into it. So this is my original custom setup. If I zoom all the way out here, we can see uh, this is about an hour, hour and 20-ish minutes of music of all original tracks. The issue I was running into is that if I wanted to do a backing track kind of setup, if I was like a guitarist, it's pretty easy to do. You just take the version, you know, you take the final version of your song, you know, delete the guitar, bounce it out, and then when you're on stage, you just shred on guitar and you have a backing track. Same thing if you are like a vocalist. You take the instrumental version of your track, you play that live, and then you sing on top of it. Really easy, pretty straightforward. However, if you have lots of different layers of sounds and you don't want to play the same instrument the whole time and you want to jump back and forth between different sounds, that leads to some pretty interesting challenges when it comes to building your setup. So this is the method that I found that works the best for me. The other thing that I was noticing a lot when building uh, these more kind of like complex setups is having redundancy and backup plans. Because when you're on stage, and this is true for me, everything that can go wrong will go wrong at some point. Yeah, as a performer, you just know that like, you know, your MIDI controller is going to die, some, something bad is going to happen when you perform, and you just need to be ready for everything. So building in redundancy and backup plans is also a big part of how I built this setup. And then, you know, hopefully you can build that into your setups as well. So uh, what I found was uh, I basically took the final versions of my tracks before I mastered them, and I bounced them out into five different stems. And these are all color coded, which will be important later on. I have a drum stem, bass, melody, lead, and then everything else. So this orange, everything else track is just fully a backing track. I don't touch it, it just plays in the background. It's a lot of like atmospheric sounds, sound effects, things that I don't wanna be doing live. Um, however, if we were to go ahead and zoom in here, this is you know one particular song. Uh, we can see it's all kind of divided up into different sounds and uh, let's listen to kind of the whole thing at first just so you get a sense of what it sounds like. And if we were to like solo different tracks here, the drum stem, there's some like weird bass sounds. We got some uh, chords over here. And we have this little yellow part here. And then we have like everything else as the background. So this kind of sounds that are in the background. So what I did is I would listen to each song from start to finish, and I would make a decision about what I thought would be the most fun sound for me to be playing at any given time. And it's different for every song. So in this song, I start by playing drums, and then I switch to playing lead, and then I play the bass for a little bit, and then I get a little bit of a break, and I play this piano part, and then I play drums again at the end. But if I go over here to this song, I start playing melody, then lead, then drums, then lead, actually skip the space part and go back to drums. So it depends on the song and the content in the song and what I thought would be fun as a performer. So this may vary a little bit. And then all I did was I just highlighted them and then just turned them red. So visually I can just identify what's going on where. So let's go ahead and zoom in here on this particular sound. So I then took the parts that I wanted to play and I sliced them up on a per note basis. So if I solo this guy,
That's that's the part I want to play. And then each one of these becomes a different slice that I just chopped individually. I then took all of these slices and I copied them and pasted them over to the session view. So I'm using like a weird combination of session view and arrange view that in glitch mob does something a little different that we'll we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but this works really well for me. So in the session view, I have lots and lots of clips. These are all the individual one-shot slices that I've chopped out of my various songs, all organized by the name of the song over on the master track. So this is that particular song. These are all the slices that I might play. And here are all the individual slices right here. So if I launch these one at a time, you're going to hear it's that exact same phrase one at a time. Like that. Uh, one thing you will notice is that these are not quantized. So as soon as I touch it, it starts playing. And that can be done down here. Uh, if you're using Live 11, you hit this little triangle, and then you go to the quantization, and you set it to be none. So not quantized clips in the session view. So this, and then I took all of these, and I mapped them to my MIDI controller. So if I hit Command M, you can see there's lots and lots of mappings in here, an excessive amount of mappings. Now here's where uh, some of the technology comes into play. I again stole a bunch of ideas from the Glitch Mob. Uh, they used the Lemur hardware for a long time, and then they switched to using the Lemur app on the iPad, and then they switched to using four Lemur apps on the iPad, and now they use like a, a PC touch screen thing. I don't I don't know what it is, um, but you know if it worked for Glitch Mob, it could work for me. So I downloaded the Lemur app for iPad, which is pretty cheap. It's like twenty bucks, and it's pretty amazing. If you have not used the Lemur app before, it can do basically anything. Uh, it comes with a software editor that looks like this, which allows you to basically like drag and drop, you know, knobs or faders, or if we want some buttons, and where's the buttons? Uh, pads right here. Uh, and then you can like edit them, you can move them around, you can change the size. If I want like a set of like four by four pads, we can put them in there, we can like change the color. Super customizable. You can do anything you want, and then these can send any MIDI message you want. So you can build your own custom interface, which is pretty cool. So that's what I did over here. Um, over here on the iPad, I basically have a bunch of effects and things over here, and then I have the pads that I'm going to be using to play this particular part. So uh, again, if I were to solo it, and I just play this. Like that. Pretty, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. However, the magic here really comes into play when you think about the relationship between the session view and the arrangement view. So most of you guys probably already know this, that if you play a clip in the session view, it will override and therefore mute whatever's going on in the arrangement view. So again, if I'm just playing this right now, if I play a note, it then mutes this track for me. So as soon as I play something, it's no longer playing the backing track. I'm now in charge of playing it, and you will hear in a second, it's not playing anything, so I can play whatever I want. Like that. So the magic here is that if I hit play, and I do not touch any buttons on my MIDI controller, the song will play exactly the same way it does on the album, which is excellent. It's going back to the redundancy I was talking about earlier. That means that if my controller breaks or there's a fire in the DJ booth and like some emergency is happening, the song will still play, and nobody in the audience will know. However, as soon as I play it, it overrides it, and then allows me to play it how I want, the way I want. So let's go ahead and try this out, uh, and that way you can see it in action with the rest of the track. The other really cool thing that I like here quite a bit is that I have this little red button here. This is going to be mapped to my back to arrangement button. So this is basically my emergency escape, which means if I mess up or I get lost or I totally screw up or something terrible happens, I can hit that button. It goes back to the arrangement and then nobody in the audience knows, to, knows it. So let's try this one more time and that way I'll stop playing halfway through and then hit the back to arrangement button. So if I stop playing, it's not playing, I hit this button. It re-enables it, and just so you can see, it's this button right here is MIDI mapped to this red button right here. So I have my emergency escape. If I need it, I can just go back to arrangement, and then boom, 
there it is. So this allows me to play the sound, play it in the order that I want, play it how I want, do it live, but still have lots of backing tracks. And then if I mess up, I have tons of redundancy and backup plans built into it. So that's kind of like the first layer of what's going on here. There's a lot of different things happening. On top of that, the other main reason I really love the Lemur application is that it can receive MIDI information. And you can program it to receive MIDI information to change the interface, which is amazing. So right now, all I'm getting are these notes right here, which is specific to this particular part of the song. However, as the song moves on, I'm going to play the bass next. Now, instead of having to scroll through a bunch of pages to find my bass pads on the application, this track right here will take a MIDI note, send it out to the lemur, it receives that MIDI note, and then changes my interface to match the next part of the song. So let's go ahead and try this out. You'll notice that as I'm, it's playing through here, it's going to be this yellow interface. And as soon as this clip happens, it switches to the blue interface, which allows me to not only see the bass notes that I'm supposed to play, but also trigger those notes. Let's try this out. This is going to switch. Like that. The same thing will happen over here. Once I get to this part of the song, this will switch. And now this is. So it switches automatically for me. I don't need to think about it. Um, again, everything's color coded, lots of big buttons here, so I can see it from a distance and know exactly what's going on. On top of that, this also means that when I'm on stage, I don't need to look at the computer. I put my computer screen off to the side, and everything I need to see is visually represented on my controller, and I can just play it. Uh, you don't need to necessarily do this. Uh, I have another version of the setup where I'm using the push to basically control everything. And obviously, you can't change the interface on the push. But you can do similar things with other controllers if you want to. But for me, Lemur just does a lot and, and really fixes a lot of problems for me and does cool stuff like that, which I really enjoy. So that's the main kind of idea here. We're basically using a combination of session view and arrangement view together and chopping up different slices of the files I want to play, pasting them into the session view, and then triggering them on the fly. And that way I have things that are backing tracks and I have things that I can play and I can kind of choose how that all works together before I get on stage or sometimes when I'm on stage. So that's the main idea between the setup. There's a lot more going on here. I have like lots of effects going on. I have other pages of things. Um, I can mix, kind of almost do a pseudo DJ mix between different songs, uh, but I don't want to make this video a million hours long. I just want to let you know kind of the basics of how you can start thinking about doing different kinds of backing track setups. So a couple of things I do want to mention that are pretty important. There are a few um, kind of negative sides of this kind of setup. There's a few things that I want to improve on or could use some work. Number one, I'm a little limited in terms of improvisation. I'm going to basically play the same sounds whenever they happen. I can change the rhythm or the order of them and like play them a little bit, but I'm stuck with those particular notes at those particular times. And part of this is just the nature of having the automatically changing interface. So future setups, you know, my, my newer things that I'm working on, um, there's a bit more room for improvisation built into it. And that way, each time I perform, it can be totally, totally different. But that's one limitation that I'm kind of stuck with, but not the worst thing in the world. Uh, number two, the, uh, the lemur is not velocity sensitive. doesn't matter how hot, hard or soft I hit this, it's just going to always be the same volume. So that's another reason something like the push is really nice. That way you get a bit more of that kind of velocity aspect of your performance. Uh, number three, the lemur is not really being updated anymore. Uh, the company that makes Lemur, or at least owns it, uh, has kind of forgotten about it. They've kind of left it behind. Um, so don't expect any new updates. Don't expect any you know, new features, anything like that. It does a lot of really cool stuff, and it works really well. It still works fine, but don't expect anything new coming out of it anytime soon. And the last big issue here is that this was a lot of work to make. You know, if I if I zoom out here, you can see like there's a lot of chopping and slicing and editing and things I had to do. There's a lot of like mapping I had to do. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I actually really like this kind of work. I think it's a really cool way to approach music production. However, when you're performing on stage, 90% of the audience, 90 plus percent of the audience has no idea what you're doing on stage and does not care. It makes zero difference to them. It's the same thing. They're going to have a good time or not. And, and your performance of, in this style means nothing to them. However, of that, you know, roughly 10 or less percent of people, 
they think it's really cool. And so, uh, you know, you might be putting in a lot of work, but only a small number of people in the audience will ever even like acknowledge it or even think it's cool or even realize that something interesting is happening in front of them. There's also always going to be a couple people in the audience that are like amazed by it. They just love it and think it's the coolest thing ever. And those are really the people that I'm doing this for. I mean, people like me who are music nerds, technology nerds, love MIDI, love figuring, like love learning about all this stuff. Um, those are the kinds of people that, you know, come up to me after shows and want to talk about it. And I think that's a really cool thing. So kind of a pro and con there. It's a lot of work. And oftentimes you get very little respect out of it or very little like love for doing it. But the times you do get love, it, it's really cool and it's really worth it. So uh, I, I really think it's fun and I really enjoy doing this. I don't perform like this all the time, but it, it's a labor of love and it shows. And I think that, you know, I have a lot of respect for people that perform this kind of way. The other thing that I do want to mention that's pretty important is that I do believe uh, this is how Glitch Mob performed probably quite a while ago, and I think they've evolved their setup quite a bit since then. I think the major difference between how I'm doing it and how they're doing it is they have switched, instead of using clips in the session view, they have been converting into just taking these clips and putting them inside of sampler MIDI instruments inside of live, and then basically doing the same thing other than that. So same basic idea, except for instead of MIDI mapping everything and putting in a clip, you put it on a MIDI track, put it in an instrument, and that's how you're gonna be doing a lot of that. The uh, And if I were to basically rebuild this from scratch, that's probably how I'd do it. But at this point, I'm too deep into it, and I'm not gonna like rebuild everything just to do that. But if I were you, and you're thinking about doing something like this, use samplers instead of session view. It's a, there's a few more complicated things you have to do to make the muting of the original track work, but this, this can be helpful. The one place I did do that was with the drums. So the drums wasn't too much effort. So I basically have three drum tracks, as you can see here. Uh, this one is going to be the actual audio. This one is going to be an instrument rack with a different drum rack for each song. So as I move from one song to the next, it just switches to a different drum rack. And then these are all drum sounds that are individual to whichever song I'm on. So this is one another way, like using samplers, drum racks, these kinds of things to organize all your samples instead of MIDI mapping everything is probably the way I would go as I kind of like reincarnate this set and kind of build a new version and kind of scrap the old version. That's kind of it, at least for right now. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a lot more to this that I have going on. There's a lot of layers, a lot of effects and things going. And uh, a lot of this was kind of like, just like a problem solving issue. Like there was, I had a vision of the way I wanted to perform and there were certain technological roadblocks that I hit along those ways, but I always found a solution to them. Everything that I wanted to do on stage, I've been able to figure out and do more or less the way I want. And it's been really fun and really rewarding to build a setup like this. So uh, hopefully this gives you some ideas as at least a jumping off point. Um, you're probably not going to build a setup quite as complex as Glitch Mobs right off the bat. It, you had to like kind of work your way up to it and build your way up to it. And I think this is a good place to get started, or hopefully this at least gives you some ideas of some directions you can go with if this is the kind of thing that you're into. So. Uh, that's going to be it for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed watching that. If you are interested in this and are curious about this, either the setup and how I built this and did things like effects or how to set up the lemur and make it respond to MIDI and things like that, uh, let me know in the comment section below and I will uh, definitely make more videos because this is the kind of thing that I can nerd out and talk about for quite a while. So uh, thanks for watching. Hopefully that was useful for you. Hopefully I'll see you guys have some cool interested uh, cool, interesting setups that you build in the future. Let me know how it goes. And Glitch Mob, I'm sure you guys can watch this. Uh, you know, let's talk. Uh, yeah, see ya.